of the Lord this morning. If you're blessed, I want you to say this real loud. Say, I am blessed. I am blessed. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I am blessed. I am blessed. Amen. We're serious about that. We're reading from the book of John this morning. Um, reading from the book of John. We're continuing the um, book of John uh, chapter 6. And uh, we want you to stay focused because I'm going to need you to answer some of the questions, participation in answering the questions. Um, and so the first question, if you're ready, if you're ready, say, I am ready. I am ready. Amen. So last week's lesson taught believers on how not to get caught up in all of the favor that our Lord has on our lives. Because we can get caught up in the favor uh, that the Lord has on our lives. You know how we uh, want to pamper people, we want to pamper our children, take care of them, feed them when they're hungry and do all of those things. Well, the Lord is even more critical about our lives, more concerned about our lives. And so um, if he allows you to go through some type of suffering, it's for his glory, which means that uh, in the end, you're better than you were in the beginning. And so th this Lord loves you so much. So, so like I always tell you, you know, when my, when my daughter was young, I, uh, she used to always, uh, uh, I'm talking about Shayla, she used to always play around with moving to the edge of the bed. And she, she had a thing about moving to the edge of the bed, and then she'd look at you to see the fright on your face. I'm guessing my wife had the fright, because I, I was like, look, if you're going to fall, you're going to fall, you know. And uh, don't call CPS on me, I'm just letting y'all know. <laughs> um, you know. So I would always look at her, and I'm like, look, you know, come, you know, all right, come on now. And when it's your, when it's your daughter, and you always look at you like, man, you don't want her to fall, but you want her to get her understanding. And it's like, look, I don't want you to fall and bump your head, and then I have to go to the hospital and, and, and try to prove why uh, I'm not responsible for what happened. So, um, you know, she would always play around with the edge of the bed. And, um, you know, the last time what I did was I placed pillows on the floor and still had pillows around her. And she was playing with the edge of the bed. And I'm like, hey, 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 stop, stop. You know, every time you say stop, she start laughing. I'm like, <laughs> You know, she ain't getting there. Like, stop, stop, oh, stop. And she, she take, she take that as a joke. Till one time I didn't tell her. And she went to the edge, just playing around. Went to the edge, she playing around, and then fell off the edge. Some of y'all laughing because y'all know you have to do your, to your kids also, right? <laughs> just let them fall. So you're not admitting it because of the rules and regulations that we have in the United States today. But the fact is, I, I let her. Let her um, um, slip a little bit. <laughs> Everybody say, long time ago? Long time ago. You gotta wait a minute. Let me, let me give you a minute here, <laughs> So anyways, back in the day, things were more than great. And so she fell off the bed. <laughs> I heard that. So she, she got to the edge and then go, why am I still whispering? I don't know. Like I'm scared. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. I got this. So she, she crosses the edge and she, she falls off the bed. And then you know how that how, how when a kid falls, they got that one or two second delay before they start screaming. And you're like, you think it's going to be okay, but they, they do that one or two seconds and you hear that. Start screaming! Anybody else? Anybody know about that? Yes. That one, two seconds. That's the that's the delay. And if that happened, you know it's gonna be a serious crime because they're building that up. It's from the deep down in. They're like, and, you know. So that happened, and I, I just kind of walked over there and grabbed and picked her up. But it never happened again because she got the point. And so uh, we're focused on doing things in the Lord. And we don't want to get caught up in the favor God has over our lives because the favor he has over us, he doesn't have to give us for the rest of our lives. He does it because he wants to, but it doesn't make him any less God. He is still God, whether he takes care of your bill or helps you in a circumstance or helps you when you're weak or, or, or helps you when you're in the dungeon, when you're going through the worst circumstances in your life, he is still God. And the evidence of that is he got you here today. And so we don't have to, when we get caught up in all the things the Lord can do for us, when we experience something like what we prayed about earlier, somebody losing a child, when we experience that, we lose focus of God because we're so focused on the blessings that he's given us. So 
for us as, as children of God, we've got to understand that the Lord doesn't have to give us anything, but he's still Lord. Can we, can we, uh, can we agree on that this morning? Amen. That God is still God in our lives, and he's still giving us eternal salvation. Amen. And that's enough. That's all we need to move on through this life. So we taught on, on that last week. We taught on how not to get up caught in the favor of God, but to uh, focus on what the Lord has, uh, uh, is in our lives, uh, the majestic glory, uh, who he is, his presence, that good feeling you get when you have that peace, that all that stuff, just this, this peace in the midst of trials, that's who God is. He doesn't have to give you that. That's who he is. When you operate in his spirit, you, are, you get peace as part of him. And so he's God, whether he does anything else for us or never does anything else for us again or does all things for us. And so Jesus, we spoke last week, Jesus is dealing with uh, those he taught spiritually. He sat around, and they sat around, and he taught them the previous day. He taught them a bunch of different things on life, and um, he's dealing with those he taught spiritual lessons to the previous day because they followed him across the lake, uh, to the other side of the lake, not because he taught them spiritually, though. They followed him because he fed 5,000 of them fish and bread. If you're hungry and somebody feeds you, which is what happened to them, they wanted to follow the one who fed them and took care of them the day before. So they were following Jesus not because of anything he did spiritually, but because everything he did in the world. And that's a dangerous thing to do. And so he informs them uh, that the bread of heaven, he's talking about Moses, he informs them that the bread of heaven, if you know anything about Moses, Moses, when he had the Israelites coming out of Egypt, he had to feed them, and the, the, the feeding of them came from the, 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 the came from God. God gave them manna. They had manna every day to eat, to feed them when they were hungry. And so he, he, Jesus informs them that the bread of heaven that was given through Moses was a shadow of the true bread. The bread of heaven from the Old Testament was a shadow of the eternal bread. Jesus gives eternal bread. Now Moses provided worldly bread. Moses provided something that fed their bellies. Jesus provides something that fills their spirits. So who do you, what do you want? You want something that will feed you for one day or feed you for a lifetime? We want the lifetime feeding, and the lifetime feeding comes from attaching to God spiritually and not just fleshly. Don't come to church because you think it's the right thing to do. Come to church because you want to learn from God. Don't come to church because everybody talks about, well, you just need to get yourself in church. Go to church to learn something from the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Amen. Look, come with a purpose. Don't come because it's normal. Come because you want to learn from righteousness. So Jesus is dealing with that. And he fed those people. And the, what Moses did was a shadow of the true bread. If you look at the Old Testament, most of the things done in the Old Testament, or all the things done in the Old Testament, led to Jesus Christ. All the sacrifices before the true sacrifice. The, the bread, you know, the, the manna that was fed was leading, was a shadow of the true bread, who is Jesus Christ. And so the true bread that's given changes lives. The manna only fed them for a moment in time. So... Jesus um, is, is, is identifying himself as the true bread that gives life. Now, the people missed out on that, um, what he was referencing. And we're starting from verse 34. He, was, he started by saying, for the bread that God gives you comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so they didn't understand what he was saying. So in verse 34, he said, uh, they say, sir, always give us this bread. Always give us this bread. So now they are asking for the bread and they're thinking, well, he fed us all this bread and fish like yesterday. 
So maybe he's just going to continue to give us this bread that he gave us yesterday. And Jesus is saying, yeah, the bread yesterday, but I'm talking about the spiritual bread, the thing that will change you when I'm not here, the thing that will change you when you're going through your worst times, the thing that will change you when you need a message from God. So Jesus now had to declare to them exactly what he was referring to about bread and about life. And so he does this in, he also uh, declares uh, the plan, the orchestrated plan, the orchestrated will of the Father. Don't, don't, don't all of us in here want to know the will of God, what he wants for you each and every day, what he desires for? How many people want to know what God desires of your life? Amen. 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 So he declares a specific plan orchestrated by the Father's will through Jesus. And this is what he says. In verse 35, he says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have all seen me, and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So there are some spiritual facts here that I want you to write down this morning. The first thing I want you to write down is Jesus is the bread of life. This is alluding to the tree of life in the midst of the garden. If you go back to Genesis, there were trees that you can eat of or that you can pick from. And one of them was the tree of life. And so this is alluding to the tree of life. And guess who that tree of life is? <coughs> Jesus. And so, um, it, it's so Jesus is the bread of life. And then uh, um, this, also say, uh, this also says, all the Father gives Jesus will come. How many? Everybody say all. All. How many? All. Some of them? All. Wow. So all that the Father gives Jesus will come. So Jesus is the bread of life. And all the Father gives Jesus will come. And the third thing it alludes to is they are his forever. How long? Forever. A, a few weeks? Forever. forever. A few months? Forever. A year and then they disappear? Forever. Not, not, not sometimes, but forever. forever. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, forever. You do? Like, I'm tired of saying it's forever. You got a sign for <laughs> So, they are his forever. So anybody who tells you that somebody can lose their Christianity or go in the wrong direction, stuff like that, no. forever, if you truly believe who Jesus Christ is. So, one, Jesus is the bread of life. All the Father gives, Jesus will come. And three, they are his forever. What does that mean? It means we are eternal brothers and sisters forever. Eternal means forever. What does that mean? It means y'all will know each other. Y'all are eternal. Y'all are brothers and sisters in Christ forever. Now, will your brothers and sisters on this earth pass? Yes. But brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus are eternal. Look at your brothers and sisters. Look at your neighbor and shake their hand and say, we are eternal brothers and sisters forever. Some of y'all looking at your wives saying, we are eternal. Wait, wait a minute. So, <laughs> as you can hear, that's a brother and sister arguing in the midst of the service. That's what they do. Brothers and sisters will fight. And so, Jesus now explains that he existed on earth. He existed on earth through birth. And he existed before he was born on this earth and that he came with a purpose. Let's read verse 38. Verse 38 is where he says this. He says, for I have come down from where? Heaven. He has come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. So he came to this earth to do his father's will. He wasn't just born on this earth and that's the first time he was alive. I'll tell you that because religion tries to tell you that sometimes. 
Jesus came down this, he came down from heaven to earth. And he said he came to do not his will, but the will of him who sent him. And whose will is that? That's the Father's will. Whose will is that? The, the Father's, Father's will. Whose will? The Father's will. Okay, so verse 39 says this. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me. He shall lose how many? None. none. One or two? None. Three or four? None. A half or one? None. none. This is none. Isn't that important to know? Yeah. Because how many of us are stressed over somebody losing salvation, getting lost, losing their connection with Jesus? You can't lose something that you weren't the reason you got it. The reason we have eternal life was because the Father work not Jesus work but the father's work not your work but the father's work so it says in verse 40 here for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. And who would be the father's work is the question we've got to ask ourselves. But it says, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. Now, if you read that fast, you skip over it. And so let's read it real slow. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. How many, how many people? Everyone. everyone. Some of them? Everyone. A few of them? Everyone. So why do we get part of it on that? It says, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. Now, who's going to look at the Son? All the Father sends Him. So it's... If all the Father sends Jesus will look to the Son, then everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And so the, the next question uh, uh, we have, let's read um, uh, uh, 41. It says, and at this the Jews began to grumble about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So now they are beginning to look at him. They're saying, uh, who's this guy? You know, who's this guy who says uh, that he comes down from heaven, who, 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 who's acting like a deity? And so, uh, so the important thing to understand about this is the son is going to raise up all who's part of the father's work. Not part of your work, but part of the father's work. You may want to save everybody, but the ones that are already saved are saved. The ones who are going to know Jesus will know Jesus because the Father does the work. And so it's important for us as believers who want to chase the Father's work is to do the will of God. Sometimes we cast our pearls among swine. Sometimes we talk to somebody who doesn't even want to hear about Jesus and get our feelings hurt. Anybody ever got your feelings hurt about talking to somebody about God? Amen. Amen. Anybody ever been so passionate about God that you get to talking to somebody and they never ask you a question about Jesus, but you're trying to tell them everything about Jesus and you're throwing up the word of God on them and they turn you down and you get your feelings hurt and they didn't get hurt at all. Anybody ever experienced that? Amen. Amen. It's because we're not supposed to talk to people who don't want to know about the word of God. You talk to people who are desiring the word of God, who are saying, man, I need a change. You say, well, you need to come to church and, and learn more about Jesus. That person says, well, maybe, maybe. See, they're showing desire. That means the father may be drawing them for what? For you to do the work of God over their lives. But sometimes we want to we wanna talk to those people who are closest to us about Jesus Christ and those people are cleverly disguised as friends and family and co-workers and those are the ones who hurt you most. And the enemy wasn't after them, he was after you. 
He wanted to touch you and pull you away from this Jesus thing because as long as he can pull you, he's already got them. So the question is, who would be the Father's work? Who would be the Father's work? Well, I'm going to give you some of them. And you may know them. Anybody ever heard of Moses? Yes. That's the Father's work. Anybody ever heard Abraham? Yes. The Father's work. Isaac? Jacob, those are the father's work. Anybody ever heard of the Israelites who believed? Not all Israel is Israel, but the ones who believed in Jesus, who believed in the coming Messiah. Those are the father's work. Anybody ever heard of Joseph? Remember Joseph? David, anybody know David? Who used to wrestle with lions? David in the lions. And who know, who know about David in here? Anybody know about David? Well, that's the father's work. The disciples who follow Jesus, those are the, 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 the Father's work. The Jews who believed in Jesus, those are the Father's work. The followers of the apostles, those are the Father's work. 2,000 years later, there are still people who have been martyred for Christ. That's the Father's work. Stephen was the first martyr, but he was the Father's work. Everybody else who gave their lives and died for the sake of the gospel, the people who were in that culling bind, that one girl who, who gave her life, who said, I'm not going to give up for him. I, I, I was, they asked who she worshipped or if she believed in God. And what did she say? Yes, I do. Willing to die. She was a martyr for God. That was the God's work. That was the Father's work. So the, mur the martyrs who have died over the last 2,000 years, they're the Father's work. Those in church who believe today, you are the Father's work. Does anybody in here believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? If you do, say amen. Amen. You are the Father's work. He did a work in you before you knew you would be here today. Amen. The Father's work. Look at your neighbor and say, I am. I am. The Father's work. The Father's work. Yes, you are. <laughs> so the... <laughs> Somebody looked at their friend and said, you are work. <laughs> no, look, look. So we're going to pray for them this morning, right? We're going to pray for them. Let's pray for, them. Let's pray for those. They, they, they talking about the wrong work. Mm -hmm. Just like those, uh, those, uh, those Jews who were not listening to Jesus. They were hungry. They were ready to be fed. So the Jews began to grumble because they knew Jesus' is father. They knew his father was Joseph. They knew his mother was Mary. And so because they knew that, they are saying things like, how could he come down from heaven if we know he was born of these two parents? If we know he came from this family, how could he be the, the word of God? How could he be anything like that? Well, Jesus answers them in verse 43. This is what he says in verse 43. He tells them, stop grumbling uh, amongst yourselves. And this is what he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up on the last day. And so uh, let's read that again real slowly. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. How many people can come to Jesus without the Father? No, no one. one. How many? No, no one. one. Wait a minute. I have my own relationship with God. I don't need Jesus. How many people can know God without the Father? No one. No one. How many people can come to the Father without the Son? No, no one. one. Wow. This is what the Word of God says. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up on the last day. He will raise those who, who's, uh, who the Father draws. He will not raise everybody. He will raise those who the Father draws. And so 45 says this. 45 says, it is written in the prophets. They will be taught by God. Who will be taught by God? All the believers, all the ones who were drawn by the Father will be taught by God. It says they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. Wow. So let's read this, Lord. Everyone who has heard the Father 
and learned from him. Learned from who? The Father. So that's an important thing. Because today you're being taught the word of God. You're not being taught the word of God by the pastor. You are being taught the word of God by the Father. The Father is using the pastor as the vessel. All I am is the vessel to teaching the word of God. You are learning the, the word of God directly from the Father when you learn it through the vessel. So how important is that in your life? It's huge because it's never about me. It's all about God. When you understand that every time you come in here, every time you come in here, you're looking for Jesus. Well, he's using me as his vessel to reveal the word of God to you, to change your hearts, to change your ways, to change your thought process. He's using me to reach you so you don't have to look far to see Jesus. Just look through what he's doing through me. It's so amazing because you're not being taught the word of God by a pastor. You're being taught the word of God by God. Now, what else does it say? It says, no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. So who has seen the Father? Everybody say no one. No one. Except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. And then he again says, I am the bread of life. Who is the bread of life? Say Jesus. Jesus. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. He's talking about what happened in the Old Testament. They ate that food over and over, that food that came from God, but they died. Why? Because they did not have eternal food, the eternal food that lasts forever. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. It doesn't mean you won't die the physical death. It means you won't die the spiritual death. How many people in here know that the spiritual death is more important than the physical death? The spiritual death doesn't mean you eternally are gone. It means you eternally don't have a relationship with God. He's not present. And the worst thing in your life here on earth is to go through something without God. Anybody ever felt anxiety before? Amen. Anybody ever had that anxiety feeling and didn't know what to do or where to go? Look, I've had it before. And that anxiety feeling without, with the Lord is dangerous. But without the Lord, it's destructive. So, so it says here, um, no one has seen the Father except the one who's from God. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread. Who is the living bread? Say Jesus. Jesus. That came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give my life for the, well, I give for, for the life of the world. Wow. So Jesus disturbed the religious leaders because Jesus claimed to be a deity. He claimed to be God. Because they thought they knew his family, there's no way they're thinking he could be from God. Well, how many people in here understand that Jesus was not from God? He was God. Amen. He was not a, a, a portion of from, he came directly from God. He was God. He was God in the flesh. So when you hear the word incarnate word, it means God in the flesh dwelling amongst his people, fulfilling the Father's will. So to sum this up, this gives us direction on life. And I want to recap the questions that have been answered today. So I need you to understand what's going on here. Jesus is the bread of life. We understand that. 
Yeah, look, he's the one who feeds us spiritually. If you want to grow spiritually, you've got to get more of Christ. You can, you can do all those other things in church. You can sing, you can praise and do all that other stuff. But to get closer to God spiritually, it's not just being in church. It, the, being in church does nothing for you if you're spiritually not connected to God. You can go to church after church after church. You can be a vagabond and wander from church to church. But if you are not spiritually connected to God, you'll just keep wandering. In order to get strong in the Lord, you've got to be grounded by the Spirit of God. In order, in order to do that, you've got to be grounded in this Word. How do I grow spiritually? The Word of God. You understand the Word of God. So it says Jesus is the bread of life. So that's one thing we understand about today, that Jesus is the bread of life. The second thing that we understand is all that the Father gives Jesus will come to Jesus. So it's not a, you're, we're, we're not, we're not in a, in a fight for lost souls. We're in a fight for the, the, the chosen children of God. We're looking for the children who God has, has selected to reveal himself to. We're looking for those who want to know about Jesus, who are just looking for you to come with the right word of God that are directly from God. So Jesus is the bread of life and all the Father gives him will come. How many will come? Everybody say all. All. Not some of them. All will come. You can't say the wrong thing to the right person. And you can't say the right thing to the wrong person. We can throw up scripture in somebody's face who's going through a trial and tribulation and all kind of problems in their lives, but if they're not ready and God has not touched them and God has not drawn them, then no matter how much you say, it's not going to change their lives. Or you can just play a worship song about Jesus to somebody. And they hear it when they get in your car and say, hey, tell me more about that. I hear you go to church and you do all this. Tell me more. How do I know if God is real? You, you ever experienced that? Because when God touches somebody, it's, it's, it's minimum effort for you, maximum effort for the Spirit of God. He will pull that person towards you. And when he draws them, you have to be ready. You have to be in field with the word of God. You have to be, because you went to service after service, because you studied the word, because you come to Bible study, because you prepared yourself, you now have the comfortability to talk to that person because you just learned it in church. So Jesus is the bread of life, and all the Father gives him will come. And they are his forever. So, Jesus, when he came on this earth, he came not to do his will, but came to do the will of him who sent him. And who was the one who sent Jesus? The Father. So, Jesus came to do the will of him who sent him. So, when we go to do the will, do we go to do our own will, or do we go to do the will of him who sent us? When we go to, 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 to want to change somebody's life, do we change it because we want to or do we change it because it's the Lord's desire to change it? The Lord's, Lord's desire. desire. We always do, we're, we're, sometimes we do our own will and we get hurt when our own will doesn't come to pass. But if we're focused on doing the, God's will, then we're focused on being a vessel of God, being a vessel, just telling people about the Lord and the one who wants to know, you pay attention to them. So, it's the bread of life, all the Father gives him will come. They are his forever, not sometimes, not for a little bit of time, but forever. Which means that once a person accepts God and has the Holy Spirit within them, they will not lose that Holy Spirit. It is theirs forever. That Holy Spirit that comes into a person is, a, is evidence of heaven in your body. When you get touched in your lives and you have an experience in your lives, you have a trial in the tribute. Anybody in here ever had a trial? Amen. Amen. Am I talking to people who've had trials in their lives? Amen. Multiple offenders say multiple. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why my hand's still up. Because we've all been through it over and over and over again. So we are his forever. Eternally. 
which means that, that that ailment you may be dealing with, or that sickness you may be dealing with, or that trial you may be dealing with, it's temporary. But God is eternal. And so if you learn to put down that temporary problem and tap into that eternal God, that temporary mountain becomes a molehill. It becomes real small in your life. And you learn to say, sickness, submit to the name of Jesus. Trial, submit to the name of Jesus. You cast all those cares upon the Lord and be faithful to what he does for you instead of what the world does for you. You tell the enemy in my sickness, no matter what pain I have in my body, I am getting up to serve the Lord because greater is the one that is in me than the one that is in the world. Amen. When your body says no, your mind says yes. Your mind says I have the mind of Christ. There is no weapon that can form against me that will prosper. When your sickness says no, God says yes. You give him all glory, all honor, all praise. When temptation comes in your life, you praise God through the scripture you've been reading over and over again instead of giving in to your circumstance. This is the will of him who sent me that I lose none. So how many is Jesus going to lose? None. none. How many is he going to lose? None. One or two? None. none. I think that person's going back into the world and doing something, but I know they believe in God. How many is he going to lose? None. none. Zero. Why? Because the Father gave them to him. Now, are there people that the Father didn't give who may seem like they know Jesus? Yes, there are people in this world, in churches, who seem like they know Jesus, but they do not know him. You'll know the people who know Jesus because they will not lose God. Why? Because God was the one who gave them. God was the one who drew them to Jesus. So, the will of the Father is that he not lose him. And who is the Father's work? Everybody knows Jesus and believes. Well, do, do I get to come with my trials? And do I get to come with the, 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 the sins I have had in my life, the things I've done wrong in my life that I'm asking God to forgive? Do I get to come as I am? Will he, will he work out those curse words I used to say and all those bad things I used to do in my life? Will he change that vindictive spirit that I have in my heart? Will he change that, 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 that anger that I have towards the world? Will he change all those ways? Yes, you can come as you are. And as you are, God will start to work things out of you. And you don't become a better person because of you, you become a better person because of God. The changes he does in you are eternal. He changes you from snapping to drop over. Now, how many people used to snap? Do we have anybody in here used to snap? Okay. Raise both my hands up. I'm raising one up for some of y'all in here who are lie. How many snappers, snappers, snap your fingers this morning? Snap them louder. Tell the truth. Somebody make you mad, you go off in a second. Somebody do you wrong, you go off in a second. You get angry with somebody. And how many grudge holders do we have in here? People who used to hold grudges. You get mad at somebody, won't talk to them for another year. Why? They owe me $20, they ain't pay me back on time. How many people been there before? Amen. How many people used to have wrath in their heart? You do me wrong, I'll get you back. Get into a relationship. What's in it for me? I'm only getting with that person because I'm looking for what's in it for me. So we do all those things. Who has jealousy in their hearts? Who has, who would say things? We could be laughing at the, the relationship when people say, man, if, 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 if I can't have them, she can't either. Anybody ever said that before? Don't raise your hands this morning. Don't tell the truth. I can't live without her. Anybody ever said that before? Yeah. I can tell how some of y'all start looking down at your Bibles now. You're like, now you read. Ooh, 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 ooh,
But how many of us have done that before? And where has God taken us from? How many of us used to get into a fight? If you get into a fight in a relationship, that relationship ends pretty fast. Has anybody ever experienced that before? I'm telling the truth this morning. There are some people, I'm wondering where they went to. Got in a fight over the weekend, never talked to them again. I'm, I'm good, that was me. I'm just telling the truth about myself this morning. Years ago, that's how I used to be. If I get into an argument with you, man, I move on. I, I consider that severed. <laughs> I'm not the guy who want to work it out back in the day. But now my heart has changed. My life has changed. So I know it's not me. It's the spirit that's in me that's changed me. Some of y'all, you know, used to couldn't handle the pressure and the pressure and you'd be out like that. But now you're learning to talk. It's like, what's all this mushy stuff that's happening? Anybody ever experienced that? You experienced it? It's like, what? I used to curse somebody out, scream at them, throw something at them and run away, flatten their tires. I'm just telling you what I did. I'm just telling the truth. I'm telling the truth this morning. There's some tires that have my name on it. I'm just telling you. Look. I can't get arrested for that now. Can I? <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. That's how it is. I'm telling you where I came from. Now, if I flatten somebody's tire, I go and fix it. I'm buying a new one. I'm like, I'm going to buy you a new tire. Well, how do you know if somebody flattened it? No, no, I'm going to buy you a new one. Did you feel so guilty about what you've done? Before, it's like, shh, done. I'm just telling you, what the Lord does in your heart is amazing when he changes you and shifts you from who you used to be to who you are. So who can come to Jesus without the Father drawing them? No one. We're taught the word of God by the Spirit of God. God is teaching us. He's using me as his vessel. I'm honored to be used by God. I'm honored the things he teaches us. I'm honored that he can preach one word. He can preach one word through me. Not only would it touch every one of you in here in your circumstances, but it'll all touch me too. It'll touch me too. And so here's the amazing thing about it. When, when God reaches us, he can reach us all with one sermon. And then all of us are saying, man, how did Pastor know? Or how did Pastor know? Or how did, how did Brother Edmund know that I needed that this morning? Or know that I need... No, it's the Spirit of God. It touches each and every one of us. How many people have been touched this morning by the Word of God? Amen. He touched you in your circumstances, your own situation, your own individual situation, because you have to look at it as it's not me. It's God working through me to touch you. So every time you show up, every time you show up for God's service, and you believe that it's God giving you a word, I can say two words from this scripture and it'll touch your heart because God meant to reach you on this day. We can pray, play praise and worship music and you'll start crying to the music because God meant to reach you. It's not the person who arranged the songs, it's God who arranged the songs for you. And so if you understand the personal relationship that you have with the Lord, you don't get caught up in everything else. Amen. But get closer to God. And so, we're being taught the word of God by God. So Jesus is the bread of life. Everyone will, that comes to, the, will come to Jesus, all that the Father gives will come. They are his forever. He came, to do the, he came here to do the Father's will. And everyone who looks to the Son through the Father that sends him will be risen up at the last, on the last day. And the Father's work is done not just through Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it's continuing on through every one of you. He's using you. You're the next Moses. You're the next Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the next disciples. You are the child, the, 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 child, the children of God who were chosen by God to do the work of God. And so you should be excited about that. Don't take it as me uh, ushering you or bringing you in. Take it as God using you as a vessel to further his kingdom. That's why you ask those questions. But what else can I do for the kingdom? You do more for the kingdom by first learning that you are from the kingdom. You are part of the kingdom of God. Even with your imperfection, God has chosen every one of you to do his work. And so all of us should be focused on one thing, eating the bread of the Lord. 
There is the worldly bread, but there's the bread of the Lord. How many people in here want to grow spiritually, want to get closer to God? Amen. So close to God that when, when he breathes, you can feel it. So close to God that you fall down in the spirit because you know that he's with you. So close to God that in the midst of death, trial, and tribulation, you raise your hands to Jesus and he's right in front of you. You can see his spirit. You can feel him. You can feel every aspect of who he is. And your cries no longer become to the lost one. Your cries become to Jesus. You're thanking him for being in front of you. You're giving him all honor, all glory. You're praising him so much that you forget about the trials that are going on in your lives. You know that he has created the end at the beginning. You know that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen. So then somebody who's negative to you, you know that every tongue that rises against you shall be condemned in the name of Jesus. So no longer do you get caught up in the animosity. You get caught up in the spirit that says, God, please forgive them because you know that your Savior will instruct the vengeance. And his vengeance is more than you could ever do to somebody's lives or anybody else could ever do to somebody's lives. And so we have to eat the bread of the Lord on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to trust more in God and do his will in every step of our lives. Look at your neighbor and say, eat the bread of the Lord. Eat the bread of the Lord. Look at your other neighbor and say, let's eat the bread of the Lord. Let's eat the bread of the Lord. How many of y'all are hungry, not in your bellies, but in your spirits? Amen. Amen. Amen.